everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I am really excited to be here. You have a great panel up ahead. And as I was preparing for it, you know, it's called My Society, Myself. And I thought, well, how did, how did I define myself? And I started thinking, you know, what is, what's the first question I remember asking myself when, when I was young? And I couldn't remember. But I could remember the earliest questions that others asked me. I mean, the earliest probably is, what's your name, right? Um, how do you define yourself that way? How old are you? you know, how old are you, little girl? I, I, re I remember those as well. And so it's very interesting that my first kind of perceptions of self came from questions that others posed to me. What do you want to be when you grow up? That's one that I definitely remember. I'm still asking myself that. Um, and these sorts of questions are part of identity, part of ourself, part of the really fascinating things that this panel is going to be talking about. And we have such a great group. We have perspectives from neuroscience, from philosophy, from psychology. So it's going to be a really fascinating way to get a lot of different insight into what makes us who we are? You know, what is it that defines human beings? And what is it that defines how you think of yourself in your own mind? So without further ado, let's uh, introduce our panelists. Our first participant um, is a wonderful neuroscientist, and she's a professor in the Department of Psychology and the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia. She researches memory, and she studies patients with brain disorders, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, eating disorders, and her work has yielded insights into how the brain changes with learning, how memories are created and retrieved, and how memory shapes our decisions, our actions, and ourselves. So please give a big welcome to Daphne Shohami. Welcome. Thank you. Our next participant is a philosopher, and he's from the City University of New York. He's a leader in the field of experimental philosophy. And experimental philosophy, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that is, but it brings empirical methods to mind on philosophical questions. He is the author of several books, including Furnishing the Mind, Gut Reactions, and The Emotional Construction of Morals. So let's please give a round of applause to Jesse Prince. Also joining us is a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University. She has appointments at the School of Management and the Cognitive Science Program. She conducts research on moral psychology, personal identity, and emotion. And her recent work examines how humans create a sense of continuous identity for themselves and others. So please welcome Nina Strominger. And our final uh, participant is a professor of psychology, philosophy, and linguistics at Yale University. And his work involves using the kinds of experimental methods associated with cognitive science to address the kinds of questions associated with philosophy. He is the co-editor of the book, Experimental Philosophy. So please welcome our final participant, Joshua Nob. Thank you guys so much for being here today. And I wanted to start, since we're going to be talking a lot about the self, with kind of the fundamental question, what is the self? How do you guys think about it? How do you define it? Um, so maybe we can start with Josh and work our way backwards to get, uh, to get an insight into what the self is according to you. Well, the question is a really good one. And I think one of the things that we've learned over these past few years of really trying to study how people understand the self is that there isn't a single way that they understand the self. It's not as though there's some one thing that we could study and say, when we're studying this, we're studying how people ordinarily think of the self. Rather, people seem to think about the self in a whole variety of different ways, often varying the way they think about the self depending on the context. So, for example, something that we've been interested in in our own work is just the idea that in some cases people think, well, there are all sorts of different things that make up yourself, all sorts of different emotions, beliefs, desires, and intentions. But at other times, people end up thinking about it in a very different way. They think, no, there's something that's the core of who you really are, something that's your true self, the thing that you really are deep down inside. And then, of course, there might be these various emotions and beliefs that in some sense you have, but those things aren't the real you. Um, well, I, uh, Josh and I work together, so naturally we agree on everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of stole my thunder. Uh, but I guess I'll just add to that, um, that um, the work that actually uh, most of the people on this panel have been doing uh, integrates this view that so philosophers or people a priori, before they've 
collected any data at all, they might say, well, the self is this or that or this other thing. Um, but the sort of work that we've been engaged in um, actually takes work, uh, like uses as its definition for the self what other people think of the self as. So we're not sort of coming down from above and just giving a definition to it, but rather saying like, well, how do the ordinary folk, uh, the ordinary folk think about the self and using that to fuel our theories about, about it. We'll also work with both these guys. <laughs> I, let me just add, I mean, why are we here today? And I think the interest in the self is symptomatic of a kind of Western individualism. The very word self makes us think about our own individual strivings and end goals. How do we organize a life as unique persons isolated from the rest? I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think one thing we're learning about the self is that the self is, is really, at its core, a social phenomenon. The reason why we have selves, the reason why we keep track of identity over time, is that we need to relate to others. And forming those bonds, those relationships, those social groups, depends on a certain kind of taxonomy of persons. Um, so I, I don't work with any of these folks, and I <laughs> totally disagree. No. <laughs> um, but I do have, I think, uh, in many ways, a very different perspective as a neuroscientist, and it's a it's a challenging one um, in the sense that I think we'd all probably agree that to the extent that we have a sense of self or there is a self, it's not you know there in our knee or our toes. It's got to be in our brain and emerging and related to biological and neural processes. Um, I think that raises a whole set of questions and answers that are somewhat um, parallel or orthogonal to the perspectives um, uh, that you guys all mentioned in terms of what does it mean to have a self? Is the self a changing entity or, a, or, or not? And how does it relate to kind of social uh, construction? Um, but I think you know, it, it helps, I think, situate the question of self, thinking about it as it relates to the brain in the context of similar questions, like what does it mean to produce an action um, in a given moment? To what extent does each action we produce pr represent ourself and inform ourself? Uh, what does it mean to retrieve a memory of ourselves? And so these are the kinds of questions that I think neuroscience has very um, specific answers to. Um, and, and I think a, a big challenge is to, is, is to, to figure out how those different um, slices of behavior tell us about the self and inform our, self, our, our sense of how a self is, uh, is constructed. So, so um, let me follow up on that um, and ask, so what, when, you're, when you're talking about the self in neuroscience, what are the sorts of questions that you think that neuroscience can actually help us answer? And then, what, you know, I, I'd love to hear um, the reaction of the, rest, of the rest of you non-neuroscientists who all work together and will be speaking with one voice. <laughs> <laughs> the duration of the panel. We will get you to disagree. <laughs> um, so I, I'd love to kind of hear you guys discuss a little bit about what methods might be appropriate to what sorts of questions, and do we need all of them to actually figure out what, what the self is? Right, maybe, you know, just start by making a statement that might sound a little blasphemous uh, coming from the neuroscientist, which is I think it's really worth asking if we want to understand the self at a deeper philosophical societal level, should we as a society care a whole lot about how it's implemented in neurons or circuits of neurons? Um, I'm, I'm interested in how that happens. So for me, that's an easy answer. And I think media and the presence in, you know, at these sorts of events here suggests that a lot of people are interested in those questions. But I think we should be very careful about how we assess neuroscientific data and it's relevant to these kind of societal questions. Uh, we also need to remember that neuroscience is really in its infancy, especially this level um, of thinking about um, brain processes in healthy human beings and how they are carried out on a very fine uh, time scale, like sitting here and thinking about questions of the self. Those are the things we want to get at, but they're very hard to get at. Um, you, you asked about kind of how we can even start doing that. What are some of the tools we have? Um, and uh, we have many, many of the most powerful tools for understanding the brain um, historically did not exist in humans. Um, we can debate, and people do, whether a sense of self is a uniquely human phenomenon. Without even engaging in that debate, I think we're interested in that aspect of it. Um, and that limits the tools we have uh, to mostly two kinds. Uh, and one is looking um, at patients with brain damage and what that does to their sense of self. And Nina and I were just discussing some of her work um, on this topic. 
Um, and you know, that, I think that, that, that can be useful. There are certainly cases of brain damage um, impacting, changing people's sense of self. And again, I think what that tells us is mostly that it's not in the knee or the toe, it's in the brain. Um, and then the other tool that I think has really changed the public uh, and scientific perception of the role of the brain in many complicated, interesting phenomena is human brain imaging. So we are now in a position and have been for about 10 to 15 years with increasing power to put healthy human beings in a brain scanner and measure where in their brain there's activity. Uh, none of us think that the self lives in a particular node in the brain. Um, so it, it, it's a challenge to come up with ways to ask the right questions given that uh, somewhat blunt tool. Yeah, so, so do the experimental philosophers in the crowd want, want to actually engage with that and, and say, well, first of all, what is experimental philosophy? Let's, let's ask that and then um, let's ask the author of the text. <laughs> <laughs> so um, experimental philosophy is an attempt to go after these kind of questions that we traditionally associate with philosophy, but using these kinds of methods, using systematic experimental studies. So the kind of thing that Daphne was interested in is the question, how is it that people actually engage in certain actions, what behaviors they perform, and so forth. But we could also ask, how do people ordinarily understand the self? How do people normally think about what it is to be a self? How the self extends over time? How the self is related to our moral identity, for example, and moral responsibility? What the core of the self is, and so forth. And experimental philosophy is the, involve, the experimental philosophy of the self involves the scientific study of that, the scientific study of the concepts that people ordinarily use to understand what the self is most fundamentally about. You maybe just to adding to that, maybe one question you often get if you do experimental work, but you uh, have an employer who is a philosophy uh, department, you get a, a lot of resistance. I think for, for people like us, we're really interested in questions. And if you're asking a question, um, you should never restrict yourself to a single methodology. For training reasons, it's very often useful to specialize. But you should be open to the possibility that multiple fields can contribute mm -hmm. to answering the questions. So if you're interested in the self, history can contribute, literature can contribute, neuroscience can contri contribute, sociology, anthropology, philosophy, and psychology. No individual can take on all of those fields, so obviously it's going to be an interdisciplinary effort, a big conversation, but the more training you can get in the more fields, the more resources you have as an as a individual to bring to bear on the topic of question. I want to just give one example going back to, to Daphne. I mean, I think with respect to the self, a very good case of where these fields have come together is in some of the experimental work that I think um, uh, Nina will talk about. We really have been finding that morality is an important part of personal identity. But what is morality? Well, sociology, law, all of those things contribute, economics. But neuroscience has helped us see that moral responses are connected to certain brain structures. One of the interesting things about those brain structures is we know their job profile outside of the moral domain. And it seems like they do at least two other things. One of them is they're essentially involved in emotion. And another is these very same brain structures, some of them, like the posterior cingulate, are also involved in perception of the body. So here we get this big social theory of the self coming out of philosophical ideas supported by psychology, linking self to morality. And then we get brain science taking that to the next stage, linking morality to emotion, linking emotion to the body. And suddenly this very cultural thing, like moral values, gets grounded in the, in the physical corpus in ways that we couldn't have really discovered, I think, without the kinds of tools that Daphne uses. Um, well, I, I want to follow up on the on the point about emotions because I think it's very important. But I'd actually um, love for Nina to talk a little bit about her experience, since you you were trained in psychology, right, in cognitive psychology, and now you are working with the experimental philosophers. So, so how you know why did you decide to do that, um, and is it driven by the questions or by the tools? You know how how does how does that work together? The question is, what brought me over to the dark side? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've always been interested in philosophy, um, and you know, even as an undergrad, I was doing work in cognitive science, which draws a lot from philosophy, as well as uh, psychology and the brain sciences. So I never really saw it as a trajectory to the dark side. Maybe I've always been in there. <laughs> um, and the decision to go into, to get my PhD in psychology was actually largely arbitrary. I thought maybe there was a marginal, marginally better chance that I would get a job at the end of it. <laughs> But it, it wasn't, I didn't feel like, you know, I defected at any point. 
Um, so working with philosophers, especially empirically minded philosophers who care about the experimental work, the scientific work, um, feels very natural and it's been um, very productive as well. So your sense is a very, of self is a very practical one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but Jesse, I'd love, to, I'd love to actually follow up on this concept of emotion um, and the importance of emotion in the self, because I think it's actually a thread that runs through all of your work um, to some extent, because we have you know, emotional memories and we have um, emotions and how they're impacted. Um, you mentioned briefly Nina's work on disease, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, and values and morality. So I'd love um, to get your perspective on what the role of emotions is when it comes to defining the self and what comes first. Well, I, I mean, I think we have phrases like, I don't feel myself today. And if you stop and pause for a minute, the idea of feeling like a self, what does that even mean? How is this self something that you can feel? And I think the insight that's captured in those kinds of cliches is that we really can, in a sort of deep introspective way, recognize when we're acting in accord with how we normally act and when we depart from that. And to not feel yourself can be, in part, emoting differently, feeling differently. Things that once stirred you now leave you apathetic. Those who have experienced kind of antidonic symptoms associated with depression, who have you know, had sources of joy, who they try to self-medicate by doing something that they found worthwhile in other periods of their life and finding themselves indifferent, are really discovering a kind of rupture of identity. So I think in that way, we, we can find a lot of evidence that emotions are central to what it is to experience yourself as being the same person. How you react emotionally is central to who you are. So, so would you be a different person um, if you suddenly descended into clinical depression? I think the answer is with Josh's original comment that the self has many facets, and there is no one thing that is the, the self. But I do think when we deal with, with mental illness, one of the challenges for people who suffer and for, for family members too, is that a lot of these symptoms are really insults to the self in ways that need to be recognized. And depression isn't just feeling down or feeling incapacitated. It really is a, a much more radical shift from your, your mode of being. Another aspect of this is depression is an emotional style. And a lot of us, I think, who have sort of symptoms of this kind, emotional symptoms, begin to identify with those symptoms. So why are so many people reluctant to give up on their depression or medicate their depression or get over their depression? Why do those phrases meet with some resistance? Part of it is your emotional mode is core to identity in a way that, that is threatened by, by significant changes, even in the positive, positive clinical directions. Yeah, do any of you guys want to want to jump in on this? I, I mean, I'm, I may have found a thing that I disagree with Jesse about, <laughs> but, um, but maybe when we talk about it more, we'll determine that there's actually no disagreement. But there is a difference uh, between feeling like yourself and this question of the, what the self feels like from the inside uh, and what would make someone else seem like a different person. And those two things can come apart. Um, so in some of my work on uh, patients with different brain diseases, uh, including uh, depression, depressive symptoms are quite common uh, with neurodegenerative diseases, we find that the extent to which someone is uh, experiencing, or rather at least displaying, uh, the symptoms of depression is, uh, doesn't at all predict whether someone says, this is the same person, or I, I feel like I don't recognize them anymore. So, uh, and that was true uh, for other emotional states, uh, happiness, sadness. Um, so it doesn't seem like emotion is playing a very big role in determining the identity of other people, their continuous identity, although um, you probably are right that um, depression uh, from the inside really changes how we, f how we feel like, whether we feel like ourselves. So actually, yeah, please. Well, so maybe just building on the kind of thing that Nina was saying. So traditionally, philosophers often suggested that ultimately the true nature of the self, the real essence of who we are, is our capacity to reason. So the thought was that our emotions are just kind of getting in the way of the self. If we could only get rid of those emotions, then we'd be able to express who we really most fundamentally are. So people would give these examples that, I, in many ways, I feel like seem compelling. So consider, for example, someone who's a heroin addict, and when he reasons, he thinks, I have to kick this, I have to get clean, but his emotions are drawing him to get another hit. In this case, maybe we would say, oh, his true self, who he really is, is this, is this something about his ability to reason? This is his that part of him that's drawing him toward getting clean, that's who he really is. This other thing, the thing that his emotions are drawing him toward, that's not who he really is. But I think what we're seeing in a lot of recent work coming out 
from Jesse, from Nina, and from many others, is that this intuition we have has actually has nothing to do with the difference between reason and emotion. Rather, it just has to do with the fact that we think that heroin is bad and that getting uh, get, get, that kicking heroin in this habit is good. And I think you could see it really easily if you just imagined taking the reason and the emotion and just sort of switching their roles. So suppose that there was a high school student who, had, who on reflection thought, I should really just start doing heroin. It will increase my social status. I'll be more popular in school. It's going to move me in a really good direction. But then when she thinks about, whenever she thinks about doing this, she just has this emotion that draws her to not do it. She just kind of feels wooky about it. just sort of feels wrong to her. So the sort of states that she has are just the inverse of the heroin addict that appears in the traditional philosophical example. And here I think we would say exactly the opposite. We'd say that voice within her, that feeling of ooginess or discomfort with doing heroin, that's her true self and her capacity to reason, which is telling her to ignore that voice. That's something she has to get rid of to get back in touch with who she really is. Actually, I'd love to, um, I, I, com- I completely agree, and I, I was thinking of making a similar point as, as it emerges from the neuroscience uh, kind of point of view, which is um, that we, we share as humans this intuition of sort of, as you say, uh, c- cognition versus emotion. Uh, one of the really interesting, um, I think, conclusions of, uh, from uh, work on the brain over the past uh, decade and more is that it, the brain doesn't respect those boundaries uh, at all, um, nor really should it for the reasons uh, you mentioned. And so the idea of thinking of feeling feelings as being separate from thinking uh, uh, doesn't make sense. We don't have uh, emotional and um, kind of rational parts in our brain that are dueling it out, even though that idea is very compelling and has been around uh, for a very long time, back to uh, uh, Aristotle, I believe, right? Um, looking at the philosophers for, uh, <laughs> for approval. Um, and so in many ways, it kind of changes the question we want to ask then is not what is it, where in the brain do these two forces live and where do they duke it out? Um, but what are the very specific circuits in common that they take advantage of? Um, and what are the principles that drive them? Because the fact is still at the level of what we do, our actions, which I think really is kind of how uh, the most um, conservative or useful way to think of the self in many ways. When we do something, we take one action. We either go for the heroine or not. Uh, We either eat the chocolate cake or resist it. Um, And so one of the things we've been really interested in is understanding not um, how uh, emotion loses or wins, um, but what are the circuits that uh, bias our behavior um, to reach for something or not reach for it, that bias our decisions to to do something or not do it. So it's it's interesting that there's such convergence. Um, I wasn't aware of it. Well, I think it's also, um, it's an interesting question that Josh keeps bringing up um, of your quote unquote true self versus kind of your other self, which isn't your true self. And um, I'd love you for you to talk a little bit more about that and also um, how much of that is actually imposed externally versus how you really feel about yourself. So if we give the, the example of the, of the heroin addict, does she think that she has a true self and something that's not a true self? Or is that just a, a judgment that we're making about her? Well, I was the one who introduced the topic, so maybe I should hear from some of these other folks. Well, you're the expert on the true self. <laughs> <laughs> um. uh, to what extent this kind of thing is introduced externally versus something that appears within ourselves? It seems like uh, uh, initially almost all research on this notion of the true self was based on how people think about their own true selves. And this research would ask, say, Nina well, about Nina's true self, Jesse about Jesse's true self, and Daphne about Daphne's true self. What this kind of research finds is that people always thought, think that their true self is something really awesome. It's fantastic. <laughs> which is absolutely wonderful in every way. So the more you feel like you're in touch with your true self, the more you feel like your life has a meaningful one, the more you feel like your decisions are on target, the more you feel like you're doing exactly the thing that you're supposed to do. And it's very easy to dismiss that kind of result. You just think the reason people think so well of their own true selves is because they think so well about everything about themselves. Everyone thinks that they're the best driver, that they're the easiest to get along with. Almost every single professor in the university thinks they're above average. So maybe in just the same way, people think that their true self is a really wonderful kind of true self. But in the, just in the past few years, people have been trying this in a different way, where they ask people about the true selves of other people. So this time, we, now we ask Nina about Daphne's true self, Daphne about Jesse's true self, and Jesse about Nina's true self. What you find then is this really extreme tendency whereby people also think that other people's true selves are good. In fact, people think not only the true selves of people they like are good, but that the true selves of the people they most hate are good. So. Even the most liberal person will think there's something within George W. Bush calling him his true (laughs) self. 
speaking to him and saying, what you're doing in Guantanamo is morally wrong. Deep down, it's not what what he's really um, being drawn to do. So there seems to be something um, about human beings that makes them think of themselves as being having a good true self, but it's not something about it being your own self. It's something that applies equally to how everyone else will think about your true self. So it, se- it seems like there's a, a moral judgment actually that is that is being imposed from from the outside, which is defining true selves for for other people. So I might think that you know the true self of someone else is good for a different reason um, than, than you, right? We might actually have it backwards. Um, Absolutely, and that, that's actually, I mean, Josh is too modest to refer to his own work directly um, when he's describing this, but he has this wonderful study where he shows that um, if you ask, if you des- uh, describe this, a case uh, of someone who is homo- has homosexual feelings, um, but since he's highly religious uh, and his religion proscribes homosexuality, uh, he believes that he shouldn't be uh, uh, gay. And then you ask people which is his true self, the, the drive to be gay that's emotional uh, or the, uh, the intellectual belief that he ought not to be gay. And it turns out that it depends entirely on whether you ask liberals or conservatives this question. So if you yourself believe that it's wrong to be gay, you say his true self is the part that's telling him not to be gay. Um, but if you think that it's, 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 it's actually a non-moral issue, whether you're gay or not, then you say, yeah, his true self are those uh, emotional drives. So th- this actually um, gets to some of Jesse's work um, about the self as being a socially determined thing. Can you talk a little bit about kind of that, that conception of our self coming from our experiences in socialization? And I'm, I was also wondering, you know, if you are someone who was raised without a lot of people around, would you develop a sense of self in the same way? Great. Yeah, I just, and we have to come back briefly yeah, to Josh's please. example of the attribution of goodness to the moral self. When I recently reread um, Hannah Arendt's uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, which is a very provocative, I think very problematic book. But one of the things that really offended people about that book when she first published it is the suggestion that Adolf Eichmann was um, banal, that there was some way in which he was just an ordinary bureaucrat who was co-opted into this diabolical project, deprived people of their desire to blame him by seeing him as an evil self. In her earlier work on totalitarianism, she had this idea of radical evil. Some people are just at their deepest core bad. And I think so the flip side, the counterpoint to the general phenomenon you're describing, is in certain contexts we really do want to uh, hold people accountable at the core. And recent work on Eichmann in particular has come out suggesting that he was a very systematic and unapologetic Nazi ideologue, which helped confirm this idea that it wasn't just that he was pushed around like in a Stanley Milgram experiment by circumstance, but that there was a driving motivation to engage in the acts that he uh, perpetrated. Um, with Chris, I mean, that is a social dimension of the self because it's, it's how we think about other people's selves. What do we want to project uh, when we talk about ourselves on Facebook and social networks? We're listing these traits and we try to list things about ourselves that will ingratiate us, but also help us form social groups. I, I just was referring a paper showing that um, if there's a transformation from being a punk rocker to being a jock, that's considered a sort of a, a bad thing. And that's a sort of a, a more radical loss of self than if you go from being um, a, sorry, punk rocker to a jock, that's a good thing. That's, oh. that's, seen, <laughs> that's seen in moral improvement, right? <laughs> if you go from being a jock to a punk rocker, that's seen as, as some sort of degeneration. Um, so we have these things we want to project to others about social identity. If you tell somebody you're a punk rocker, they're immediately going to form all kinds of associations with you. But one of the things that happens in these group membership identities is we form affiliations. We find like-minded people. So why is it so important on Facebook to say your political values? And the answer is you don't want to have any contact with people who are your political opposites. So if you find out the person you're dating, and we have some data on this, uh, belongs to a different political party, even now with like Bernie and Hillary, I've lost friendships. (laughs) <laughs> over you know who which candidate you support for the Democratic nomination, mm-hmm. that that divide makes it impossible to form close affiliations. So when you say I'm a Hillary person or I'm a Bernie person, you're saying something about your identity that bears on who can be your friend, and um, that that I think is a deep revelation that the self is not about me qua individual. It's about me qua group. Who are the, who are the people who are going to fortify me in life as part of my extended identity? 
So, so wouldn't that depend though on how important politics were to you personally? So doesn't it actually depend on, on the person and the relative importance of different things to your sense of self? So if politics is totally unimportant to me, I'm not going to lose any friendships over, over Bernie supporters. We, we thought so. So with a collaborator, uh, Javier Gomez Levin, we, we did a series of studies where we gave people all kinds of traits that might matter to identity. Occupation, are you urban versus rural? What are your uh, pastimes? What are your music tastes? And so on. Among these, we also had politics and religion, which are very, very moral dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, then we asked people, how important are these things to you? That was one question. And then, if these things change, would you still be the same person? For things like musical taste, people tended to give very high ratings of importance. Music really matters to me, or being urban, or my job really matters to me. Occupation is extremely important to most people. But when those things change, would you still be the same person if you changed jobs, if you moved to a small town? Sure, yeah, that wouldn't threaten my identity. Would you be the same person if you changed your political party affiliation? Would you be the same person if you went to a different church, adopted, maybe went from being an atheist to a theist? There people say yes. And strikingly, in response to your question, they say that is a threat to identity or change to identity, even if in the first question, they said it isn't very important to them. So if you find somebody, and Nina has some data that, that go in a slightly different direction on this that are very interesting. If you find people who say morality doesn't matter much to me or politics don't matter much to me, and say, OK, so in the next election cycle, what if you've started voting for the other side? Or what if you started really caring about politics all of a sudden? Would, would you be the same? And people tend to say no. Nina, do you want to? Yeah, so um, we have this data that shows that, um, so first of all, we find that the, the part uh, of the self that's the most important to saying that someone's the same person, uh, with, if you look at different parts of the mind, so your memories, uh, your moral capacities, your personality, uh, your preferences, the things that you like and dislike, uh, basic cognitive capacities, uh, the factor that matters the most. Um, and all the other all the factors, they matter a little bit. Um, the one that matters the most uh, are your moral values, your moral beliefs, your moral actions. Um, but if you go to psychopaths, um, and we have this data, we, we, so we give people a, a psychopathy test. Um, and actually, uh, so you can have a, someone who's a clinical psychopath, you can also have, so everyone in this room would score slightly different uh, on uh, the psychopathy uh, test. Presumably there's no one out here who's like a perfect psychopath, uh, but there's some natural... It's, it's one in a hundred. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there might be like a perfect 40 in the audience right now. Um, but for the most part, uh, uh, there's, there's natural variation and people you know, who are sort of high, but our subclinical might, you know, go into business or something. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, if you go, uh, if you go and uh, go to these people uh, and you give them these same sorts of battery of tests, they no longer show the preference for um, moral traits, um, which goes against the suggestion that oh, it's really about uh, maneuvering through the social world, um, because surely it's very important to uh, a psychopath to know, you know, who can they manipulate, who's gullible uh, and trusting, and so forth. Uh, it really seems like what's going on is they say, well, this is what's important to me. Uh, uh, are these moral traits important to me? No, not really. I don't value them. Therefore, they're not really important to uh, the identity of other people either. So I'd, I'd love to have Yeah, I'd love, I'd actually, I'd like um, to make a, a comment. And, and if, am, I, am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, so th um, the comment is that in, in studies of uh, things like decision making and choices, right? So again, I'm, I keep emphasizing like the actions people take. Um, there's a lot of data showing that um, if you ask people to choose, let's say, between two options, either for reward, like between a blue square and a red square, and they're going to get money, and they do this 200 times, and as the experimenter, you're controlling how likely they are to win on any given choice. People readily engage in this, especially undergraduates who are excited about getting the money. Um, and um, if you ask them later what they did, they will come up with a story about how they made their choices. But if you look at what they actually did, it doesn't fit their story. It fits often a story we have about how the brain should be driving the actions. Um, and so I've really come over the years and many of my colleagues to feel like asking people what they think only tells you what they think um, and doesn't necessarily get at why they're doing what they're doing. And I guess that's a long lead to the question of, um, and I, I ask it uh, kind of uh, naively, um, 
do you take for granted that asking people what they think makes a self is actually, that those answers actually tell us what makes a self a self? Um, absolutely not. Um, the, I think that these, these two are, they're distinct. Um, but at the same time, the question of what actually makes a self a self, although uh, it, it's a metaphysical question in many ways, it's not a question that probably it could be answered uh, satisfactorily with any sorts of studies. Um, I, I mean, I just I, I I agree with Nina and I with the fourth of your question, but I would say as a matter of descriptive fact, morality has this weird kind of tenacity. There's work by Linda Skitka on what is called attitude strength, and it turns out psychologists measure this in different ways. How intensely do you feel about something? How important is it to you? And if it were to change, would it be a kind of um, uh, a loss? How connected is it to your, your other core stabilizing values? She found that morality was the only thing that showed up as correlated across all measures of attitude, strength, and very consistently high. There were also studies of political party affiliation in the US over the lifespan. Within a 40-year span, the variation is about uh, six people remain the same to about a degree of 65%. So within basically a whole voting life from your earliest elections to in older ages, you're voting pretty similarly, despite dramatic changes that might be taking place in your society. If you look at 10-year periods, it's about 80%. Take the big five personality traits, the most validated traits of personality that have ever been studied, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, um, neuroticism, and agreeableness. Those are less stable. They're very stable. But the, you can look at, at say, five, 10-year uh, intervals. And in some studies, the, the agreement over those times is, again, in the 60-something percentile for, for fairly short periods over the lifespan that can drop off precipitously and very susceptible to dramatic life changes. Political values, which is an indirect sort of measure of moral attitudes, do show a kind of tenacity that I think is unusual among our traits. So, so one of the things that um, I'd love for, for Daphne to talk about, since I think the, th the three of you have been emphasizing morality as kind of the most important thing, and Daphne obviously studies memory. Um, and um, I'm curious about your thoughts on whether memory might be more important than morality to a sense of health. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I would have to put it as a competition uh, between them. I think for me, um, somebody who studies memory, I think the point I'd want to make um, in the allotted time <laughs> is that memory is much more fundamental to our behaviors in general than we think. It's not just our ability to remember something we did yesterday, but is that many of our actions, if not every single one, is informed by past experience one way or another. Um, and I think that's a very interesting, um, uh, an interesting challenge is to understand how that emerges. Um, it, makes sense um, uh, for a brain and a being uh, to take advantage of our past experiences and use them. And so the, 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 the key question I'm interested in is exactly how that happens. Um, so I, I think memory is fundamental to many aspects of our behaviors, including our sense of self. And one of the biggest questions then is how, as uh, for us as neuroscientists, where we're just in many ways starting out, we know um, a pretty solid amount about the likelihood for any one of us at any given moment that will remember a particular event. Okay, So we know a lot about how an individual memory is formed and then retrieved. Uh, I think the, uh, the interesting um, intersection between memory and sense of self starts when we try to understand how those memories get connected over time. And we can think um, from the memory angle uh, on the self as a self as being sort of emerging as a uh, interrelated with the memories as they unfold over a lifetime. Um, so we're, you know, as, sci as scientists of the brain, we now can say what happens with a single memory, maybe with two or three memories. And we know that a big um, job that the uh, parts of our brain that form memories, one of the big challenges is that they are constantly weaving our memories into a network. Uh, we'd like to think that that network is, on one hand, g gives rise to a sense of self, uh, but we also know, and I think it's important to emphasize the other direction, um, that we our, our sense of expectations about the world, I don't know if you count that as self, but there are, the way we perceive the world will also 
change the way our memories are formed. So our memories are very personal in that sense. They're absolutely not just a veridical record of what happened in, in a given moment or our lives. They're influenced heavily by what we expected would happen, and those expectations are shaped by the memories we had before them. So I think there's this. Um, I think there's an interesting role for memory. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't think of it personally as being in competition with morality per se. But I don't study morality, so um, that might be why. Well, I would actually suggest that this work is not in competition with, your th with what you're saying in a very different sense. So what the three of us have been studying is the question: How do people ordinarily understand the self? And then that's a very different question from understanding how it is that human beings actually perform actions. So I feel like. Suppose that we found that people ordinarily understand the self as being uh, constituted in such a way that some certain thing is the most fundamental thing. And then you found that, in fact, that thing just is the thing that most fundamentally guides people's actions. In a way, I think that, that would make our discovery less interesting. Because then it wouldn't be that surprising that people think that's most fundamental. Because it just simply is what's most fundamental. What would, make, what would be most surprising on the part of, for us to discover is if there, people seem to all be converging on something as the absolutely most fundamental part of the self, but then when neuroscientists actually began to study it, they found that plays little role in anything. So it seems like, far from being there, there being a competition if we find different things, it seems like it would make the work all the more exciting if these different kinds of research programs ended up uh, identifying different things as being sort of what's at the core. And I, th I think that's largely what's happened, um, in, in my opinion, with consciousness to some extent. It's interesting. We all think it's interesting. We all sh read about it and wonder about it. One of the findings emerging from neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology is that it appears to play much less important a role in many of our actions and behaviors and, and even reasoning than we thought it did. Right, so suppose that people who study how people ordinarily think about consciousness found that the way people ordinarily think about consciousness is exactly the way that you think that the consciousness actually works. Then the study of how people ordinarily think about consciousness would be a slightly tedious research program. By contrast, suppose that you discover how consciousness actually plays a role in people's actions, and then people studying how people think about consciousness find that it plays a, radi that it plays a radically different role in people's ordinary conception of their actions. Then things become interesting. We have to ask, how do people come to have this conception of their actions that so radically departs from what neuroscience is telling us? Well, it's, sorry, Justin. Yeah, may, maybe, in, in Nina, if you want to talk a little bit about the memory um, moral contrast as it's come out in some of your work. Um, oh, well, I guess I mentioned it in passing before. Um, but when, we, um, when you ask, so you could give people a scenario where you say, imagine that uh, it's the not too distant future, and this man, Jim, he gets into a, a car accident, uh, and the doctors give him a little microchip to replace the part of his brain that gets damaged. And then they, they do all these detailed tests uh, and psychological measures uh, to see if he's okay, and they find one of the following things. Uh, they either find that he's psychologically normal, no change, uh, or they find that um, he's lost all of his memories from before the accident, or they find that um, he's lost his moral compass, he no longer knows the difference between right and wrong, and we have a few other uh, conditions. And we find that um, if he's lost all his memories from before the accident, people say that's much less important to the question of whether Jim is the same person now as before, as if he's lost his moral compass. So certainly for folk judgments about uh, the nature of personal identity, um, morality plays a much uh, larger role than memories, even if it, that, that ends up not being the case uh, for uh, what actually drives behavior. Yeah, when, when we first discovered this, it really was striking from the perspective of someone trained in philosophy. If you studied the theme of personal identity in philosophy, the starting point is John Locke. And in 1690, he wrote a book that really was the book about the mind for the next 200 years. And in that, he has a very seminal discussion of what makes you the same person over time. And it's a bit difficult to interpret this old text and what, what's the view, but it does look from his examples like memory is the key. What makes me the same person over time is that I can recall my past. I can bring up these past episodes in my mind. So when we started to ask ordinary people what they think about this, and Nina has done really at this point a couple of dozen, dozens of experiments we have asking this question, they tend to think memory isn't that important. It could be a fanciful case or a very real world case. We all have relatives who have suffered from memory loss um, through aging. And we have to ask, is it the same person? And in all of this work, we find memory loss does impact our sense of this being the, the loved one who we've always had, but not to the same de degree as change in values. Of all the things we've measured, and we keep trying new things, morality just 
continues to show up as the trait for which identity is, is framed. It really looks like the one that's most, most crucial. If you imagine an older relative whose values start to change dramatically, that looks like they're, they're less of the same person than an older relative who's, who's lost memory. And to me, that really is the kind of discovery that even though it's, it's common sense that we're probing, all of our training and what identity is has sort of gotten us to look past this core feature that's now emerging empirically as, as central to the self. Yeah, it's a great example of the value of experimental philosophy, right? Because uh, for centuries, philosophers were focused in on this, this one trait. And um, as Jesse said, they're just looking past what actually is going on. You know, John Locke had this one intuition uh, that might not be shared by you know, the majority of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise, philosophy. Right, yeah. <laughs> that might be the relevant one for how people actually um, make decisions, but, right? So, but, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I think, I think, as, you know, as, as Josh was saying earlier, these are slightly different angles on the same question that are likely to um, disagree in interesting ways. Um, and I guess, you know, my, one of my questions would be, why do we think that morality is not related to memory? Because I think one of the things, you know, I'd say is that memory really informs a lot of behaviors, even when we're not aware that it does. Um, so the idea that even moral, that moral judgments um, are not um, guided by or informed by memory also seems at least a question, I would think. Can I, I just want to push on this uh, uh, point that you're making a little bit. Um, so if you take someone who has radical memory loss, uh, like HM uh, or other sort of famous uh, amnesic cases, um, is it not the case that they generally have the same moral character as before? It's, it's a little bit debatable, actually. The original reports on people, so HM, should I? Please, let me, yeah. <laughs> so um, HM um, is uh, a very famous patient who suffered memory loss and had an absolutely transformative effect on our understanding of memory in the brain. Um, he had a very severe case of epilepsy that could not be treated uh, pharmacologically with, with medical treatments, um, uh, drug treatments, and so they performed surgery on him when he was in his late 20s and removed the focus of uh, where the epileptic seizures were taking place. And that location, often in epilepsy, is um, in an area called the hippocampus, which is kind of an, on, on the side of the brain, inside the, uh, in the center of the medial temporal lobe. Um, the good news was uh, that that uh, surgical treatment uh, helped cure the epilepsy. Uh, the unexpected bad news was uh, that HM was no longer able to form new memories. So he didn't really lose uh, memories of uh, from the lifetime, but the doctor would come in every day, and every day um, HM didn't recognize the doctor. And if you try to um, uh, probe uh, HM to remember what he did yesterday and, and tell you about it, he couldn't. He couldn't create uh, new memories after losing uh, this part of the brain. Um, and the um, this was um, scientifically uh, astonishing because most of the theories in neuroscience until that point about localization of memory in the brain, so back to the previous century, um, had indicated from animal research that memories are not in one part of the brain, they're distributed all over. And what happened to HM revealed that no, actually there's one part of the brain that seems to be important, crucially important for one kind of memory, which is kind of that creating a record of what we would typically think of memory, what you had for breakfast yesterday. Um, sorry, I kind of went into uh, no, 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 that's te fine. teaching mode. <laughs> um, the very interesting thing has happened with HM, and it's actually uh, um, exciting um, to have the opportunity to talk about HM today because one of the most famous scientists who interrogated HM's memory over a lifetime uh, was Sue Corkin from MIT, and she passed away uh, about a week ago. Um, and HM passed away several years ago, and so anybody who's interested, there's a, there's a lot to read about it, and Sue Corkin did amazing uh, work and kept on interrogating him um, and doing research on his memory. And that's turned out to be really interesting because the first past result led to the consensus that this part of the brain was specialized for what people call declarative memories, the ability to remember what happened yesterday or the day before, and that everything else was intact, like imagination and creativity and morality and so forth. Over the years, um, that turned out to not be true, um, and that there were a lot of other more subtle um, changes in HM's behavior, and since then we have 
there are many more people um, that have damage to the hippocampus because of uh, hypoxia or uh, encephalitis, various other um, situations. Um, and these people suffer, many of them, from memory loss, uh, but understanding that what that memory is turns out to be um, much more complicated. Uh, and one example that I think is related uh, potentially to morality, um, uh, although, I, again, you know, I, I, I don't know, tell me what you think, is that if you just ask people to imagine a scenario, a hypothetical scenario, which it sounds like often happens uh, in sort of assessments of moral judgments, um, that without a hippocampus, people don't imagine that scenario in the same way. They imagine it in a very impoverished way. So if I just asked you, imagine this event is unfolding in two years, tell me about it. I don't know, it's your, it's your birthday in two years. Um, most of us go into a lot of detail and apparently vividly imagine it. People with damage to the hippocampus, which our textbooks tell us is just memory, um, don't imagine that in detail at all. They give a very, very vague kind of sense of what's going to happen. Um, and so I think that's relevant here just for thinking about memory as playing into something that, you know, it had no business playing into based on the way we understood things initially from HM, which I imagine, here and here you can tell me that I'm wrong, must be important for things like moral judgments. Just a, a couple of brief comments. One, first, um, very much in agreement, a, um, a former student of mine um, named Felipe de Brigard, who's now a professor of neuroscience and uh, philosophy at Duke, wrote a dissertation where he asked the question, what is memory for? And we all might think that's obvious. Memory is for remembering. It's for recalling the past. But what function does it have in evolutionary terms to, to revisit all these episodes? Is, is nostalgia that useful evolutionarily? And the answer that he arrived at really systematizing a lot of trends in the memory literature that you're involved with is that memory is about the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. Memory is really about planning. It's about using our past to make decisions to how to, about how to act in the future. Deprive someone of memory, and that will be impaired. I, I had uh, Endel Tolving as a colleague for a number of years, who was one of the pioneers study, studying this kind of memory and studying work with HM and other patients with amnesia. And I asked Tolving, you know, does, does HM really have a moral life? And his answer at the time, just based on conversations, was, that there's a way in which his sense of his life is very superficial. You ask any of us, what's, what is your life about? What are your projects? Why, what are you in this for? Uh, Camus begins uh, one of his books saying, the most important philosophical question is suicide. Is, why do we go on? Life has no meaning, so why, why, why bother? Why face tomorrow? And uh, I think all of us can reflect on that question deeply in ways that are informed by our past and, and that's part of our morality, our decision of what kind of person I want to be can guide my sense of meaning in life. I think for somebody who doesn't have access to the past, that's going to be limited. And the kinds of answers I think that HM would give to Camus' question would look very different than the kinds of answers that we would all give. So I do agree, morality, just as you pointed out that reason and emotion are not separated in the brain, I think memory and morality are not fundamentally separated in the brain. I also agree, but I also have something that I'd like to add um, that this is reminding me of, which is um, this old uh, Oliver Sacks essay. And I know there was a, uh, a tribute to him at this festival uh, earlier this week. Um, and he wrote this wonderful essay. If you haven't read it, you should go out and just leave the festival right now and read it right now. <laughs> um, called The Lost Mariner, uh, where he discusses uh, a patient with Korsakoff syndrome. Um, and uh, people who are familiar with Sachs's work will know that one question that he was really obsessed with is the question of personal identity. Um, and this whole essay is about uh, this man with Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, Korsakoff syndrome uh, is uh, the result of being an alcoholic. Uh, after many years, I think it's a vitamin B deficiency, and the temporal lobes just disintegrate. Uh, and um, uh, this patient, Jimmy, he had completely lost um, not only uh, his, his ability to form new memories, but also almost all of his uh, memories from the past as well. And so he lived in this sort of bizarre sort of world where he couldn't live in the past, he couldn't plan for the future, um, and he was really only barely hanging on by a thread in the present. Um, and uh, so the, the question that Sachs interrogates is, um, so is Jimmy the same person, or in what sense does he have any kind of identity at all? And in the beginning part, just you know, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what happens in this essay, um, he's really obsessed with this idea that you know, memories really are preventing Jimmy from truly 
existing in any real sense. But then he, uh, in, a, in a twist, uh, he observes Jimmy taking the sacrament at church, and he sees how he's transcended. Uh, he sees how he reacts to the holy music uh, and, and uh, how he acts um, when he's praying. And he says, um, Jimmy was not a spiritual casualty at all. Um, since he could still uh, be moved morally and religiously and spiritually, um, he still very much existed. Uh, and the fact that you know, he doesn't have his memory traces anymore, but that's just, you know, that's just machinery. Uh, that's not who he really is. And so he absolutely has survived despite this devastating brain damage. So I would say that his true self, right, is still, is might still say. there, even <laughs> though might say. everything else... You, you might say, but not only might you say that, but that's the sort of key finding coming out of Nina's work about people who have neurodegenerative diseases. Oh. That, that those who lose their memory, their spouse is still... Right, so um, if you go to people's uh, families uh, 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 who suffered brain damage um, and you uh, ask them about oh, what are the symptoms that, this, that the patient has experienced and also, you know, do, you, do they seem like a stranger to you? Do you feel like you still know who they are? Do they seem like the same person deep down uh, or not? Uh, and then you build a, a, a big fancy model. Uh, what you find is the extent, and I think that Jesse alluded to this earlier, the extent to which uh, at least people are observing uh, memory loss actually doesn't predict at all uh, whether you think this person has changed or not. Um, the, the, almost the only thing that matters uh, is the extent to which their uh, moral capacities have changed. The one, uh, the one symptom that we found also in, made an independent contribution to identity, we, we weren't expecting it all. No philosophers or, or really almost any kind of psychologist uh, predicted this, and so we were also surprised, is there is a, a smaller but still significant effect of uh, loss of language. Um, so if, you, uh, if the loved one could no longer uh, speak or speak fluently uh, with the patient, um, this was uh, uh, having a, a significant effect on whether you would say this is the same person. We thought that was really interesting because language just hasn't really been absent from the, the discussion in the literature. Uh, well, one of the things you keep saying, though, is others think of them as the same person. What about themselves? You know, if you are experiencing dementia, do you still see yourself as the same person, or is your fundamental sense of self altered and i know that if you you know there's work on if you ask people this question before they experience any changes um a lot of people will say you know i don't want that to happen right. and a lot of people are still able to make decisions end of life decisions when they are in the early stages of dementia there have been um some really <sighs> lovely pieces of writing on people who said i'm committing suicide here because um, i'm losing part of myself every single day this is when i can still make the decision um, so I'm going to end my life, and they do. Um, so it seems that to them, even though to other people, other people might not agree, they, th they still think that you're in there somewhere. You don't agree. You think that you are being lost. I think it's a very interesting dichotomy if you're, if you're talking about the self as external versus the self as perceived by you. And it's really tricky methodologically. Um, if you were trying to, you know, I, if you were trying to compare, say, um, what's the effect of memory loss versus morality or any other cognitive capacity on your own sense of personal continuity for a few reasons. Because we'd love to just run this study again uh, on the patients themselves. Um, but there's a few problems. One is, when you lose your memories, you begin to forget who you used to be. Uh, another problem, uh, which might be even an even bigger problem, is that most people with uh, different forms of dementia don't know that they're sick, especially past the very early stages. So if you ask them, are you the same person as before, or even uh, do you have a disease, they say, no, I'm fine, nothing's wrong. Uh, so it uh, becomes very difficult to, um, to figure out what's actually going on, because people are no longer able to refer in an objective way to the person that they once were. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I was thinking about, obviously, with, you know, Muhammad Ali's uh, death. Is he, was he the same person as the Muhammad Ali we all knew? And I know you study Parkinson's. Um, so, so it would be, it's interesting to me that, is there a tipping point, you know, where, where people lose, lose themselves? Uh, it, it, it's an interesting question, especially since I think what, you know, what's coming out of this discussion is, well, are they losing their sense of themselves? Are their family losing them some, their sense of self? Are their actions and decisions actually changing or not, right? So these are all different measures and they don't have to uh, agree. Um, uh, the, Parkinson's disease is in many ways a particularly uh, scientifically interesting uh, disease in the sense that um, the, the main thing that happens in Parkinson's disease is a loss of dopamine neurons in the midbrain that project to a target called the striatum. 
And so that's something that's been known for a while. What's uh, been interesting is the discovery that when people show up with the very first, mildest, earliest symptoms of Parkinson's disease, um, they've already lost 70 to 80% of those neurons. And so that tells us uh, something we don't uh, really know how to interpret well about uh, the redundancy, at least in this, in this particular circuit. And just uh, the, the, the question of tipping point mm -hmm. uh, uh, suggests that at least in terms of the brain circuit, there is a tipping point for motor control, right? Those are the symptoms that people show up with. Um, a lot of the work uh, we've done has to look, uh, has, been, has been looking at um, how the lo that loss of dopamine um, changes people's ability to sort of gradually learn associations over time. This is um, uh, interesting to us because it's a form of learning that's very different from what we would typically call memory. This has nothing to do with what you did yesterday. And this is the kind of learning that patients like M a HM typically are pretty much okay with um, and, and depend on memory. Um, and, um, you know, that it's very hard for me to relate that to self in any kind of meaningful way without getting completely um, lost in speculation. Um, and, um, you know, but, but we, what we have done, we have some data on um, how people do, uh, people with Parkinson's do this sort of implicit learning um, and um, how well their families seem to think they're functioning and how much they think they've changed. Um, and those two things do seem to go together so that the family's perception of how motivated a patient with Parkinson's is to engage in everyday life uh, seems to be somewhat related um, at least to how well they do on this very kind of boring lab kind of experimental measurement. Um, Just to, I mean, to comment on, on Ali in this particular case, I think the tragedy of seeing his degeneration you know, has different, different loci. And one of them has to do with seeing this incredible athlete who's lost that physical control. But I think much more devastating, much more profound for those who were admirers of Ali is that he had been this tremendous force in civil rights. I mean, he was an extraordinarily courageous civil rights leader. And to see that outspoken, articulate, brilliant uh, leader enter a phase in life where he could no longer do that. We all know people who live in athletics or in dance or other physically demanding careers won't be able to sustain that. But we might expect that kind of leadership to be sustainable. And I think the, you know, the, the, the ravages that he experienced through Parkinson's probably prevented that to some degree. There's some apathy associated with Parkinson's, there's some depression associated with Parkinson's, some, some impact on memory. So all of those things are really limiting the social position he can play with respect to leadership. And for me anyway, and I think for many others, that was the most sad, the most, the most significant shift in who he was as a public persona. But could I come back to the, this issue that we were talking about earlier? So, and, you know, back at, at the beginning of our discussion, Jesse was emphasizing this idea that the self is attached to something social, to our connection with other people. But then there was sort of a fight brewing because Nina was suggesting maybe it's not in the sense that um, people with psychopathy could recognize the same sort of social impact, but wouldn't have the same kind of intuition about the self. So I, I feel like I really regret that we didn't really continue the fight. I just wanted to see, <laughs> what, do you, what do you guys think further about this topic? Well, part of the issue is that the jury's still out, and since, I mean, I, I don't have a dog in this fight, so however the data turn out is what uh, will be where I end up, you know, um, laying my chips. But uh, that being said, uh, I don't know if when you bet you can lay your chips after the <laughs> and, um, uh, it, it does seem, so one way of, of, rec of sort of rectifying this or like bringing these two things together is to think, uh, maybe there is a proximate level or the level of the mechanism, um, and that's the part that's getting disrupt. That's instantiated maybe just as you think within yourself, well, what do I value? Uh, and then I'll say that that applies to other people's identity uh, for what's important for them. Um, but maybe uh, at a more, at a, an ultimate, a functional or even evolutionary level, it, um, the whole reason why we, this mechanism was put into place or set into motion uh, is because we care about social relationships so much. And actually, um, in some new studies that we have, uh, when you make you know, one of these big fancy models again, and we pit, so if you ask an individual about you know, how much would their identity change, but then we also ask a bunch of other questions. How much would your social relationship with someone change if this trait changed? How much, how much do you value this? How much do you think is related to morality and so forth? What you find is actually all of these things matter a little bit. Um, uh, and, and social relationships actually 
uh, also matter, um, at least when, you, when you're uh, asking about um, judgments. So it's not, I don't think the two are necessarily in competition. Um, well, I mean, I, I, coming back to Josh's opening comment, I, I do think we need to recognize that um, identity is a construction. Um, reuse that word. I'm a social constructionist. So in, in the science wars, there are the science fans, and then there's social constructionists, and they're supposed to sort of not get along. I'm a science-grounded social constructionist, and partially because I think science is in the business of construction. So take the periodic table of the elements. It's supposed to be the most fundamental description of the stuff that, um, that makes up the universe, or you can get a bit more fundamental. But So what are these elements? Well, you could organize them by atomic weight. Um, you could organize them by atomic number. You could include elements that actually exist in the real world or ones that don't, merely hypothetical elements or lab-created elements. You could include isotopes. You could include ions. All these decisions need to be made. So what's considered elemental um, is actually a set of, of arbitrary decisions. Not completely arbitrary. These are real things. But the way you describe the fundamental building blocks of reality has a lot of degrees of freedom. The way we describe human identity has a lot of degrees of freedom. And if you talk about so being a mother, being a mother could be a matter of biological connectedness, or it could be a matter of playing a social role. Could a man be a mother? Could an adoptive parent be a mother? Those are questions that we get to settle by decision. We get to settle questions of gender by decision, questions of race by decision, and I think questions of personal identity also by decision. And because it's based on decision, context matters. There's work on how genes are defined in science. It depends on the subfield. If you're in, in behavioral genetics, it may work differently than in some branches of molecular genetics. So I think we need to recognize that for many of our purposes, morality might be very, very important for bookkeeping in human identity. For others, memory might be important. For others, various cognitive capacities may be important. All of these things are equally real. All of them, are ma all of them matter. But we get to decide, given a goal, which one matters most. Great. Well, I think that's a very good point um, on which to end this part of the discussion. Let's first give you guys a huge hand. And then we will open it up to you guys to ask your questions. Um, and there will be two mics that will be traveling around. Um, yes, up here. Jen uh, hold on. Please wait for the mic before asking the question. Thanks. Hi. What? Well, thank you. It was a very a great presentation. Now, how do you, Jesse, define morality? What are the basic constituents of morality? <laughs> I think we need another uh, panel for that. <laughs> That's a big and hard question. Um, I, I've come to think that morality is very connected to emotions, which is something I alluded to at the beginning but didn't explain. So we have various different kinds of beliefs about the world. Some of them are just you know, factual beliefs. Dinosaurs are extinct. Aardvarks are nocturnal. Others are evaluative beliefs, and these include aesthetic values. This painting is beautiful. This one is ugly. Preferences for, for food, um, for friendship. Moral values are among these values. And I think the difference between fact and value, psychologically, is that values, expressions of, of preference, of, of desire, of beauty, but also of right and wrong, fundamentally come down to our feelings about things. So this is an old idea associated with people like David Hume in the history of philosophy that says morality is really an expression of, of deeply socialized, strongly felt feelings. So when we train our children to be moral, when we change our, train, our, train our communities to be moral, we're trying to encourage them to be outraged at injustice, to feel uh, disgusted at criminality, uh, to feel pride and delight in, in generosity. It's all about the emotions. It's a very controversial view. Um, yeah, back there. Um, yes, you, but yes. Um, hi. So I think that uh, question that I had for the gentleman with the awesome hair. Um, <laughs> all of you. You're all of you. <laughs> um, no. When you were talking about uh, projecting out if your if your values, your political values, for example, change in the future, that that would be a big change of self. And I think there's a lot of research that shows that we are we we believe we will act more ideally further from now. Um, we can yeah. take into account all of our everyday small decisions. So um, my question is the. Have you done research where you look at people who've had big, maybe political or ideological shifts, and then ask them, have you changed? 
uh, has your inner self changed and do they just simply rationalize it with language that yeah my my large moral ideals have changed but i'm still the same person oh that's such a great question the, the short answer is no and we'd love to and it's sort of on the on the agenda it's difficult research to do partially because of finding a big enough sample of, of people who've undergone those changes in an independent way to measure that they have in fact undergone those changes i one of the things that got me interested in this topic um, I, I started thinking about the concept of moral death. So we think about this in, in, in dramatic changes. So that most of the neocons, the architects of neoconservatism, began as, as really left-wing liberals. And then they, so what happens, what happens there? Are they the same people? Was Patty Hearst the same person when she was so-called brainwashed? When people undergo religious transformation, so consider the newborn Christian phenomenon, uh, is that really an, a, a kind of death of an old self and the beginning of a new self? We know that from a third-person perspective, people judge these things to be uh, changes in identity. We know from first-person perspective, hypothetically, when people are asked, if you change in this way, would you be the same person? We tend to say no. But to actually interview people who have undergone those transformations is a very, um, I think, logical and exciting direction uh, for, for us to move. So you're really anticipating where we, where we want to end up. So hopefully the next panel will have an answer to that question. Yeah. Great. Um, so we're back there with the tie and blue shirt. Around the era that cognitive science was born, there was a lot of debate in, in the United States as Eastern traditions found their way in as to whether the self was fundamental or not, whether we could deconstruct the self, um, whether the self could even disappear, which was sort of an aspiration within at least the folk psychology of many Eastern traditions. And I wondered whether most of what you have talked about seems to be about what aspects of the self seem to be malleable. But I wondered whether there's any of your research that reflects upon this question about whether the self can be dismantled either for a short period of time or in some extended way. Yeah, so um, I have some work with uh, the philosophers Sean Nichols and Jay Garfield where we go to um, uh, Tibet uh, and look at Buddhists. Um, and now in Buddhist, in Buddhism, there is uh, the doctrine of no self, um, where uh, what this tenet says is that uh, the, uh, the, you know, we might think that we have a self that persists over time, but this is just an illusion. There really isn't a, a self uh, in any meaningful sense. Uh, and this is a doctrine in part uh, that's meant to have these positive consequences. So uh, as soon as you let go of this sense of self, uh, you won't be selfish anymore, right? Because there really is no distinction between you and other people. You'd be more generous. Uh, and also, you should be less afraid of death. Uh, because you'll understand that uh, death isn't anything special, the death of the physical body, because uh, the self is you know, being destroyed in its own way continuously over biological life as well, and there's nothing actually all that special about uh, uh, the death of the physical body. Uh, now, so we've run into this research thinking that we were going to find this, uh, and that the Buddhists were going to be so enlightened uh, about these issues, and it turns out uh, we found two things. Uh, first, we found uh, actually the Buddhists are more afraid of death. Um, and specifically, they're more afraid of um, the destruction of the self. So if you give them like a bunch of different, why are you afraid of death? They are terrified of the idea of their selves being destroyed at death. And so it, this paradoxical effect, uh, and there's another paradoxical effect, where we, uh, we give them a, a generosity task, essentially. Uh, would you give uh, some life-saving medicine to other people? Or how much longer would they need to live uh, in order for you to agree to give over your medicine to them if you were also going to die? Uh, and we find that and this is, we com there are comparison classes with American subjects uh, and also uh, Indian subjects uh, uh, who are Hindu. Um, and we find that the Americans and Indians, I mean, everyone's selfish, right? No one says, oh, I'll just give away my pill. But the, but the Tibetan Buddhists, they, and they're like, no way, I'm not going to, not, in fact, two thirds uh, of, of these, and these are lamas too. They're in, you know, school to be trained uh, to be priests. Uh, the two thirds of them say there's no amount of time that this other person could live that I would give my medicine over to them. 
so uh, one possible, I mean, we were, you know, we were sort of blown away by this. One possible explanation, though, is this relentless focusing on, you know, how the self is always being destroyed is actually quite terrifying. Um, and that it just sort of makes people even more like reactive and attached to the self. So uh, it's possible, although uh, the jury is still out, it's possible that um, this might not even be a worthy goal to try to destroy this illusion of the self, um, even though it might be you know, very much an illusion. So, Josh, I, I, I was wondering, could you ever destroy the true self, or is that something that's not destroyable? It's an interesting question. So, people seem to have this intuition that the true self is, in some bizarre sense, immutable. So, people seem to have the feeling, like, whatever is my true self at this moment, it will be my true self until the time that I die, and it was my true self from the moment that I was born. That, of course, I could have these changes on the surface, where something that I had that sort of appeared to be what, what I was like was, was shifts to something else, but that those sh- surface changes seem like they're just sort of uh, illusions that appear just on the uh, top of the water, but there's some deeper thing that's sort of remaining like, the constant the whole time. Of course, it's very unlikely that scientific study of the self would show there is such a thing, but people really do seem to think that. For maybe more along the lines of the Hindu conception that these Buddhists are attacking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we spoke previously about the almost <laughs> separateness between memory and morality in the experiment that Nina mentioned with the gym, the car accident sufferer. Um, and I wonder if, I mean, morality, the, the, moral, the moral compass is essentially the difference between right and wrong, which requires a memory of what is right and what is wrong, a kind of mnemonic schemata that you apply over the course of time. And I wonder if it's possible that there's a um, um, sort of memory-based fabric underneath morality, and if so, how can that be tested empirically? Daphne, do you want to tackle this? Um, well, that's I agree. <laughs> I, uh, in the sense that I, th- I think I think there's sort of memory fabric beneath almost many of our behaviors uh, of that sort. Um, I, I think, you know, that general statement is very hard to test. And I think that, um, you know, the fact that Nina brought up patient to HM is really useful for that. Um, I actually think that the data from um, people with dementia is uh, less informative for this question in the sense that we know that what dementia does is like what happened to HM is the inability to create new memories but people with dementia remember most of their memories from a lifetime, so one would think that those might be the most informative. Um, there are some studies, um, for example, uh, kind of bolstering this perspective, right, but that um, leaders tend to make decisions about real world uh, crises and events that are heavily biased by one event that happened when they were at a critical period of their life. Um, so there's a lot of memory, a lot of research showing that events that happen in our late teens, early 20s to ourselves and to the world around us have a very large disproportionate effect on how we think of what is um, the uh, best decision later on. Um, I don't know if that's been done in the moral context or not, but um, that would be one way to start getting at this um, with, uh, with studies looking at kind of how, how moral judgments later in life are impacted by events at different uh, phases. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think there are potentially ways to get it empirically, like looking at HM, people like HM, who have not been tested on standard scales of things like psychopathy, which look at sensitivity to the moral domain. So that would be a very straightforward way to do it. But I think there is so much evidence in life that these things are connected. Um, if if uh, people in this room are all old enough to recall the outcome of the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial, for African Americans, the idea that evidence had been planted was so credible and so vivid uh, that the, a, a verdict, an, an acquittal in that case, would seem like a just decision. For a white population who are oblivious to sort of systemic harassment of various kinds from law enforcement, um, a, an acquittal would be a case of injustice. And so how do you make those decisions? A lifelong of experiences with people in law enforcement, with members of a community who've had such encounters, inform that decision in very, very important ways. So I think moral uh, understanding, a flip in this case, opposite moral intuitions about the same case, uh, are clearly showing the effect of memory here. Yeah, there's a hand way in the back on that side. 
Hi, so I wrote this down. I wouldn't forget. Uh, something like like narrative structures, which seem to be obviously like a human construction. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But has that in any way been imprinted, like neurologically, over time? It's a it, it's a great question. Um, there's a, there's a lot to say about it, but just let me give you one uh, simple uh, example that speaks to narrative and memory. Um, there's been work by uh, Jeff Sachs and Leila Devachi, who's actually here at NYU, um, showing that the way our brain organizes memories is influenced by narrative in the sense um, of taking advantage of boundary shifts. So you can tell a story and connect one part of the story to the other part of the story where the word and, or you can tell a story where instead of the and, there's a and then, or something like that that implies a pause. Um, and that the brain then kind of is more likely to group together the events that happened in one part of the narrative separate from the other part of the narrative based on these kind of hints on, on, uh, on, uh, on the narrative structure. Just a, a quick, quick addition to that. In philosophy, theories of personal identity mostly involve memory, but the next most popular theory of that after that is a narrative theory, which says what makes me the same person over time is my capacity to weave a kind of life story together. So um, with Sean Nichols, um, we did a study to probe ordinary intuitions about this. So we asked people to imagine somebody who could still draw up memories from the past, but couldn't organize them into a coherent narrative, maybe like uh, the, 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 using the capacities that Daphne just described. Would it be the same person? If you can't organize your life into a story, are you the same person? And overwhelmingly, we found that people answered yes, that, that losing your narrative capacity is not a threat to the self. Uh, it's not much of a threat at all, and it's certainly not nearly as much of a threat as losing your moral values. So one by one, we've gone through theories of personal identity from philosophy and shown that none of them explains ordinary judgments as much as continuity and morals. Um, yeah, the lady in the middle in the t-shirt. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for just uh, engaging each other and us in a really interesting discussion. Um, I was particularly interested by uh, something that you said, Jesse, that in um, kind of looking at sort of uh, neural correlates of um, morality-based decisions, they involve like really emotional areas of the brain. Um, what, like how, kind of in sort of like historical evolutionary brain development, how old or, um, or new are those areas? How human specific are they? Good question. I, I think they're very well conserved. In fact, I think the, much, of the, much of the neocortex is well conserved across mammalian phyla. So most, I mean, you can use rats as models for studies of just about every human psychiatric disorder just because there's so much uh, conservation. There are important differences. Many of them are not well understood. Even if you take great apes, you can see things like the laminar structure, the layers of cells in visual areas, which are very important for, for primate cognition, are different than in human beings. So there are differences, but I think the differences um, are greatly uh, outshadowed by the similarities. So the brain areas that get involved, orbital frontal uh, areas, areas like Broadman area 9 and 10, which are sort of right here if you drive your fingers through your head, temporal pole, which if you drive your fingers through your uh, temples, the entirety of cingulate cortex, which is one of the oldest areas of, of the cortex, which in the middle of the brain is just this, if you know what the, the corpus callosum is, the bit that holds the hemispheres together and allows for communication, the bit of cortex that surrounds that comes up in a lot of these studies. One area that might be a, a difference maker, superior temporal sulcus, which is very involved in aspects of social cognition, like attributing mental states to others, uh, is another big player in moral cognition. We, we, these structures do have homologs in, in primates at least, but we do know that our capacity to use these structures to engage in high levels of social cognition uh, is, is appreciably, appreciably greater. Uh, so there is some possibility that there are some distinctive human capacities involved uh, in, in morality. I would say that non-human animals probably don't have moral rules in the way that we do, partially because they lack this aspect of social cognition, the really the rich sense of how is this going to make someone else feel, those kinds of questions that are so important. What were the intentions behind this action? Was it an accident that you harmed that person, or did you forethink that 
those things are so core to a lot of human morality in ways that make me think the differences might matter. But with respect to the brain, I don't think we're, we're seeing those differences come out as of yet. I don't know if Daphne wants I think I'd, I'd just add that um, it's not, one question is whether the areas exist, which is important. Um, some newer studies are suggesting, not for morality per se, but in general, that one thing that changes is how those areas talk to each other, where the connections are, um, even in areas that all exist across species. Um, and so that, that turns out to be um, an important dimension for understanding cognition, thinking, and reasoning in general. Yeah, Matt. Um, so there's data showing that when evaluating others' identities, we pay more attention to morality than memory or personality or taste or intelligence. And I'm wondering if uh, it's even possible or uh, if it's possible to test which one of those is actually most predictive of behavior in some general sense, as if that's even a, a co coherent question. And if it is, how might you approach it? Josh, do you want to tackle that? You know, I think that a lot of the discussion we've been having has, has to do with the, con the relationship between this idea we have of um, uh, how, to how we ordinarily understand the self and the science of the self, so how people's actual behavior works, how people actually b perform behaviors. But I think if you want to understand how people think about the self, I don't think that the re way that reason we think about the self in the way that we do is because we have some specialized system for thinking about human beings in the way that, for example, we might have a specialized department, the Department of Psychology, or that is in charge of understanding how human beings behave. Rather, we have a general way of thinking about things. We just apply that thing to the self. So in particular, we have a general capacity for just thinking about the essences of things. So we can think about what is the essence of you know, Nina Streminger, but we could also think, what is the essence of this band? What is the essence of the university? What's the essence of science? What is the essence of the United States? And in each of those cases, we show this exact same effect. So if you ask people, not what is the essence of Jim, but what's the essence of the United States? What's the United States really all about? Then people who have really different views about what's good, each say that what the United States is really about is that thing, the thing that they think is the good thing. And then, of course, the United States does all this other stuff. And for different people, it's the opposite things, which they think is the other stuff. But whichever thing they think is the bad thing about the United States, they think that's just kind of some superficial phenomenon. If we could get back to the essence of what the United States really is all about, it would be this good thing. So what I'm thinking maybe in response to Matt's question is that you shouldn't think of um, this capacity we have to think about the self as somehow, as it were, an attempt, either successful or failed, to do the psychology of the self. You should think of it as an application of this much more general capacity we have to think about essences, about what things are really about, to the particular case of human beings. Great, yeah. One very brief addition to, to Matt's question. I mean, I, I think, and this came out in, in Daphne's questions about the importance of behavior. We can ask ourselves in each case, will a change in moral values affect behavior more than a change in memory? And there's no, not going to be a fixed answer. There'll be certain domains where that difference really does matter. So we've been looking at it a little bit in the context of, of parole cases. Um, so to go back to our, a, a related case of past criminality, our old friend Adolf Eichmann, so suppose Eichmann had been captured in Buenos Aires some decades later. So he wasn't captured in, in the 60s. He was captured, say, in the 80s, and he was uh, already experiencing dementia. So now you ask Eichmann, um, do you remember your uh, transgressions when you were working for the Reich? And he might have no memory of that. Imagine he has no memory of that. But imagine that he still is deeply committed to his uh, anti-Semitic uh, agenda and now ask yourself, if you were given the opportunity to reoffend, would he reoffend? Uh, and there it seems like the answer might be yes. So merely forgetting your past crimes doesn't necessarily reduce probability of reoffense in the same way that moral reform would. So in the context of parole, we're right now just doing it with hypothetical cases, but we're starting to do archive work too. The, the hope is that we can see the impact. We know that with parole decisions, change in values really matters. Um, and I think the reason for that is with respect to this particular issue of criminal behavior, we know that that's a difference that makes a difference. Um, whereas a, a loss in memory or maybe even in some cognitive capacities wouldn't necessarily give the same, uh, same reassurance. But if I might respectfully disagree with that, <laughs> so um, what, what Jesse is saying, which I think is a very reasonable hypothesis, is that the reason people do this, the reason that, for example, in parole decisions, people care about this question is because they're trying, because they care about behavior. They care about whether someone is going to re-offend. And that would really make a lot of sense. 
But I don't think that's what's going on in this case at all, actually. I think it has nothing to do with something that makes sense. It has to do with just our general ability to think about things and whether something is the same thing as something else. So say Jesse commits some crime, then we find someone, and we're trying to figure out whether that person should be convicted. We want to ask the question, is that person Jesse? If it's not Jesse, if it's someone else, then we can't convict him of the crime that Jesse conv- uh, was the one who performed. So this study that Jesse mentioned a number of um, uh, uh, minutes ago about someone who is either a punk and turns into a jock or a jock who turns into a punk is actually a study about this very phenomenon. So people think of punks and jocks as equally willing to equally likely to commit certain kinds of crimes. It's not as though punks commit crimes but jocks don't or jocks commit crimes but punks don't. But if you switch between them, so say you're a punk and you commit a crime you're shoplifting and then later you turn into a jock, people think less that you should be punished. Not because they think that now you turn into a jock, you're less likely to shoplift again, but because they think they can't convict that person of the crime because it's not the same person anymore. It's not the punk who originally committed the crime. Great. Well, um, I we are unfortunately out of time, even though I could listen to you guys speak forever. So let's give one more huge round of applause to an amazing panel. <laughs>